He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen. You know, we, we, we're here, we're celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua, Jesus Christ. And there's, there's just this anticipation, this bubbly excitement about the day and what it means for us. But that's not the way it was for the disciples when this literally first happened. Now, I don't know how many of you have played hockey, but when you get checked, but you get checked and you don't expect it, you know, you're just paying attention to the puck and all of a sudden out of nowhere, bam, you get blindsided and you get knocked up and knocked up against the wall. And then it's like the cartoons with all the planets and the birds tweeting around you and you're like, you know, you, were, you, you weren't expecting it. You were blindsided. Or, or, or if you haven't been in hockey, maybe you've been in a car accident and you get T-boned. You know, the light's green for you. So you're going through that intersection and wham, you get blindsided. And then just there for a second, you, you, you got to remember where you are. You know, you're, you're just kind of shaken. You're in shock. You don't remember what happened or, you know, or who hit you or what's going on. And you got to remember where you were and what you were doing. And in life, we get blindsided. We make plans and we think things are going to go like clockwork and we're excited about the future. And all of a sudden there's a monkey wrench that's thrown into our plans. We get blindsided and it's not what we were expecting. And we sit there in shock and shake our heads and like, what am I going to do? This wasn't supposed to happen like this. Well, that's the way the disciples looked at the whole crucifixion. Now, Passover was coming up. The most important, the most celebratory time on the Hebrew calendar where they commemorate the victorious march of the exodus of the children of Israel out of Egypt. They plundered the Egyptians without firing a single shot and they walked out to freedom. And they're celebrating, ironically, they're celebrating this freedom while being in captivity to the Roman government who's ruling Israel at the time. Who tells you when you can stand and when you can wipe your nose and all this stuff. And so the, 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 the expectations were there for the coming of a Messiah that would redeem them from the oppression of the Roman government. And I'm sure most of the disciples who walked with Jesus felt this way. We, he's the Messiah. He's the Son of God. He's of the line of David. He's got, he's, he's got the right to the throne. He heals the sick. He raises the dead. He has authority over the, over the elements of nature. He calms the seas. He casts out demons. And they probably thought that when Jesus said, go get that colt. And they say, well, why do you need this colt? Say that the Lord needs it. And the triumphal entry into Jerusalem. People are getting excited. The populace, the, 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 the low crowd takes palm branches and just throws the branches over the road. People are putting their cloaks down for Jesus to go through on this humble, lowly donkey. And he's making his way to the temple. And maybe some in the, in the crowd and maybe even some of the disciples. And I bet Judas thought, this is it. He's going to take the throne. He's going to, to go to the temple mount and proclaim himself as Messiah. Pro proclaim himself as king. He's going to unleash his power and, and the authority of all the angels to take care of these Romans. So, you know, the, 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 it's like a crescendo. It's, it's building up and building up just like that song, Christ Arose. You know, it's just this, low in the grave he lay. Very sad, very mournful. But then we get, from the, get to the chorus. Up from the grave he arose and it just skyrockets. Everybody was on that kind of a high. And then he goes in. He doesn't proclaim himself king, but he does the next best thing. He makes a whip and he cleanses the temple. Beats out the money changers. Goes into the court of the Gentiles and it's like Walmart. Like a big yard sale or flea market. He says, get rid of these animals. You've, you've made this house of prayer into a den of thieves. Gentiles supposed to be worshiping here. You're keeping the people of the world from worshiping God. And the disciples are probably, yeah, yeah, getting excited. And maybe the Roman guards and centurions are kind of, you know, getting a little antsy and kind of looking towards one another. It's like, well, what do we do, guys? I mean, is this, I mean, do we have orders or don't we? So the disciples and, 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 and all the crowd is just getting ready for this Messiah to come. 
to deliver them from Rome and to take his rightful place on the throne of David that's been unoccupied for hundreds of years. And then they have the Passover Seder. Christians call it the Last Supper. It was the last Passover Seder. And he longed to, to, to have this Passover Seder with his disciples, his intimate uh, group of 12. And they're celebrating freedom. And they're like, man, it's just around the corner, guys. This Passover Seder is like the icing on the cake. By Passover's end, we're going to be free people. By Passover's end, man, those Romans won't know what hit them. They're probably confident and they're just, just, just relishing. I mean, they're eating themselves into a food coma with all the great food at the Passover Seder. And then Jesus throws this into the mix. Like, Jesus, why do you have to harsh on our buzz, man? Why do, you have to, why do you have to tone down the excitement? Because in Matthew chapter 26, verse 31, it says, Jesus said to them, tonight. I mean, this is the Passover. Spirits are high. You know, they're expecting great things. They're ex tonight, all of you will fall away because of me. Ha, uh. They're all excited, and all of a sudden, the air's let out of their tires, man. And then he quotes from Zechariah 13, 7. He says, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And they're probably thinking, well, okay. What was that about? Oh, Jesus is always saying these weird and cryptic things we got to figure out later. Let's not focus on that. It's party time. Let's focus on the Passover and what it means. Our freedom, our freedom. But sure enough, it happened. Just as Jesus had predicted, just as the prophet Zechariah predicted, because in Mark chapter 14, if you'll turn there with me, Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 48. Talk about being blindsided. The disciples were blindsided. They didn't know what hit them. And in Mark chapter 14, verse 48, <clears throat> Jesus said to them, this was he, they're in the garden, right? Jesus just prayed and, 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 and sweated great drops of blood. His disciples were sleepy. And he's like, get up, guys. This is it. And they're like, what do you mean this is it? Well, what's going on? Jesus said to them, have you come with swords and clubs as if it were a criminal to capture me? Every day I was among you teaching in the temple and you didn't arrest me. But the scriptures must be, must be fulfilled. Then they all deserted him and ran away. Now Mark tells on himself here. This is the gospel of Mark, but we could call it the gospel of Peter because it's believed that Mark got this account from Peter himself. And he says in verse 51, Now a certain man, <coughs> who will remain nameless, but it's probably me. <laughs> now a certain man wearing nothing but a linen cloth was following him. They caught hold of him, but he left the linen cloth behind him and ran away naked. Indeed, the shepherd was struck and the flock scattered. Could you imagine the confusion of the disciples? Wait, this is not how it's supposed to happen. This is not how it's supposed to be. What could all this mean? Oh, surely Jesus has planned for a comeback. Surely he's going to put a stop to it. If he can stop the raging seas, certainly he can stop this mob from the temple and from the Roman government. And we, we, we remember how Peter tried to take matters into his own hands and ends up chopping off a guy's ear. And he says, put away your sword. Enough of this. So at this moment, confusion reigned and dreams seemed shattered. All hope seemed lost. All the disciples, but John was watching the brutal execution of their would-be king by Passover's end. Their rabbi, the Messiah, the very son of God. They were watching from a distance, all but John. He was the only one who had the guts enough to be there right at the foot of the cross. With women, no less. The rest of the disciples probably watching from a distance, probably some of them hiding in alleyways and in, 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 in caves or, or in, in homes. And they're probably shaking their heads thinking, oh man, they're probably bewildered and devastated thinking, 
How, how could this happen? Uh, how could this be? I don't get it. I don't understand it. This isn't the way it was supposed to go down. I thought, I thought, we always get in trouble when we say, I thought. Some of us may call that presumptuous sin because we presume something's going to go down a certain way and it doesn't. And James warns us of that. He says, no, we should say if it's the Lord's will, I'll go to this city or that city and conduct business. We've got to get in the habit of saying if it be the Lord's will. So turn with me to John chapter 19. John chapter 19, starting with verse 28. Yeshua, Jesus, is on the cross. Surely by now they realize that all their hopes and dreams of this messianic kingdom, this messianic revolt against Rome, this takeover of the Temple Mount from the, from the, Sanhe from the Sanhedrin and from the Sadducees who were in bed with the Roman government. They weren't religious. They were fakes. By this time, the people that were running the temple were corrupt. The true priests, the true Sadducees, the true Levites were off in the desert preserving the scrolls, the Dead Sea Scrolls that we know today. So the disciples were expecting this big takeover. And here, Jesus is on the cross. Surely it's all done. Surely it's over with. Surely our hopes and dreams are dashed. They've been blindsided. And in John 19, verse 28, it says, After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished. See, up to that point, there was still hope. You had people jeering and mocking you. Oh, well, if you're the son of God, the chosen one, the anointed, save yourself. Save, save us as well, the thief said on the cross. He could have called a legion of 10,000 angels to come down and rescue him. Surely that would have proven that he was the Messiah. Surely that would have proven he was the son of God. But he knew if he did that, we would not be sitting here today celebrating his resurrection, his victory over death. Today, none of us would be saved or even have a hope for salvation. He had to let it play out to the very bitter end. No matter how disappointed or disillusioned or bewildered or blindsided his disciples were. After this, when Jesus knew that everything was now finished, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He said, I thirst. And a jar full of sour wine was sitting there. So they fixed a sponge full of sour wine on a hyssop branch and held it up to his mouth. And when Jesus had received the sour wine... He probably propped himself up on that, on that spike that was in his heel, causing pain. And he had to prop himself up or else he wouldn't be able to enunciate his words. He wouldn't be able to breathe. And with his last ounce of breath, he said, it is finished. And then he bowed his head and he gave up his spirit. I can't imagine the disciples at that moment what they thought. Boy, it is finished. We're done for. We didn't expect this. They thought the Roman government had killed Jesus. They thought the corrupt Jews had killed Jesus. But Jesus said earlier, no, 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 no. No one takes my life from me. I willingly lay it down. And I will take it up again. Could you imagine wide-eyed, struck silent, mouths wide open in shock, they're probably holding their head in their hands, their eyes wide, shaking their head, their mouth open, and saying, it, it was all over before it even begun. They were in such shock, probably to the point of Job's friends. You remember Job? Job was so emaciated by the sickness that he endured that his friends came to visit him and sat there in shocked silence for seven days because they couldn't believe it was him. They couldn't believe what had happened to him. He lost his health. He lost his fortune. This is what the disciples were going through. They had lost it all. All their hopes and dreams and things they banked on was now gone in their eyes. You can't come back from death, can you? I mean, sure, Jesus raised the dead, but there's no way he could raise himself. It's got to be. Surely it's over. They're probably saying, what now? And you know, if things couldn't get any worse, they put his body in the tomb and three days later, it comes up missing. Assumed that somebody stole his body. 
When you, when you mess with a body after it's been uh, entombed, it's considered a desecration. It's considered an insult. So to add insult to injury, to kick a man while he's down, their beloved rabbi was stolen from the tomb, they assumed. He wasn't there. So we read in John chapter 20, verse 19. When it was evening, the first day of the week. Now, the first day of the week. Oh, Sunday, right? No. Saturday night sundown. Remember, sundown to sundown is, is considered a Jewish day, a Hebrew day, a biblical day. So it was evening at the first day of the week. It was Saturday night. The disciples were gathered together and the doors were locked. <laughs> Why? Because all of a sudden, the disciples found themselves as fugitives. Guilty by association, right? You may have some guys that rob a bank, and you may have no idea they were going to rob a bank. They're just saying, hey, man, can you stop here? we got to get some money out of the ATM. Okay, sure. And then they put on ski masks and rob the bank. And then they go, come on, come on, quick, 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 let's go, let's go. And they drive away. Well, you didn't fire a shot. You didn't wear a ski mask. But guess what? You're guilty by association. You drove the getaway car. These disciples were considered fugitives from the Roman government. They were considered dissenters. They were considered uh, a, 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 a revolting mob uh, to, to try to take over the government. They were wanted men on the lamb. No pun intended. They were branded as revolutionaries and they were hiding for their lives. Could it get any worse? I mean, this is supposed to be Passover. It's supposed to be the season of our freedom. We thought that Jesus was going to take over the Roman government. We thought that he was going to proclaim himself as king in the line of David. We thought, we thought, we thought, we thought. And just like being blindsided in a car accident, they never seen it coming. There's something else they didn't see coming either. Something else. They weren't expecting either. So it says in 2019, when it was evening at the first day of the week, the disciples were gathered together and the doors were locked because of the fear of the Jews. <laughs> Yeshua came and stood among them and probably in such a familiar voice. Shalom Aleichem. Which in Hebrew is peace be unto you. That is the regular greeting. That's how you say hello, goodbye. That's how you wish someone well. It's shalom aleichem. Peace be unto you. They pro all their heads were probably hanging low. They were probably staring at the floor, shaking their heads. None of them have probably ate anything. They've lost their appetite. They're thinking, what are we going to do now? Where are we going to hide? Are the doors are locked. What if they come banging on the door? What are we going to do in the next couple days? We got to find a way out of Jerusalem. We got to, maybe we'll go to a cave. And then all of a sudden, unexpectedly, the doors were locked. And somehow, some way, Jesus got in. And he says, Shalom Aleichem. Peace be, uh, be with you. Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. You better believe they rejoiced. They didn't see the crucifixion coming, but they didn't see the resurrection coming either. They never saw it coming. <laughs> Having said this, he showed them his hands and his side. So the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. And Jesus said to them again, peace be to you. As the father has sent me, I also send you. After saying this, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas called the twin, one of the twelve, he was the healthy skeptic of the group, right? Was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples were telling him, we've seen the Lord. <sighs> yeah, right. I mean, mass hysteria, wishful thinking. Come on, this doesn't happen. I mean, sure, yeah, Jesus raised people from the dead. He can't raise himself from the dead. He's dead. 
He had his doubts. But he said to them, if I don't see the marks of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the marks of the nails and put my hand into his side, I'm never going to believe it. You can say all this all that you want, but I've got to see it to believe it. A week later, his disciples were indoors again. And Thomas was with them. And even though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Shalom Aleichem. Peace be unto you. Then he said to Thomas, come at me, bro. <laughs> I'm paraphrasing, obviously. But he says, come here. Put your fingers here and look at my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Don't be faithless, but believe. And Thomas responded, my Lord and my God. Jesus said, because you have seen me, you have believed Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believed. Blessed are you and you and you and you because none of us have seen, but yet we believe. Yes. Amen. You know, we've read Revelation. We know that there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. He's going to make all things new. Wipe every tear from our eye. There'll be no more death, no more pain, no more sorrow. But there's going to be one thing left over from this old world. One thing from this old world that's going to linger on into eternity. And that will be the wounds in his hands and his feet and his side. And it's going to be an eternal reminder that what he did is why we are there. How blessed is that going to be? So folks, does it seem like everyone and everything is against you? Your hopes and dreams are crashing down around you. Things are not going according to plan or working out the way you thought they would. Bewildered? And you just don't get what's happening? And you're saying, Lord, wh why, Lord? Trust me. It's not the end for you. Victory. Victory is coming. Victory is coming. Matthew 28, 1 through 4 says, And after the Sabbath... As the first day of the week was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to view the tomb. And there was a violent earthquake because an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and approached the tomb. He rolled back the stone that was sitting on and, and was sitting on it. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was like white as snow. And the guards were shaken by fear of him that they became like dead men. I mean, we've seen all these shows and, you know, of, of something happening and women going, oh, and the women just crumpling and fainting, right? And the guys catching them. Well, have you ever seen a guy faint? These guards fainted. They were so scared. They shook in fear and became like dead men. John 14, 19 says, because I live, you will live too. You may be saying to yourself, well, Pastor Chris, you just don't know what I'm going through. I wouldn't call this living. I'm in debt. I'm about to lose my job because of COVID. I'm, I'm about to lose my house. My kids are on drugs and my grandchildren are far away from the Lord. Uh, I've got a terminal illness. I got cancer. I got all, everybody's against me because of my beliefs. They make fun of me because I'm religious. And they're saying, why are you holding on to your faith? Curse God and die. I wouldn't call this living. Ah, there's more to life than this body. There's more to life than this mortal coil. Go ahead and destroy it. That's not my life. He says, because I live, you too will live. And in John 10, 10, he says, I'm not just going to give you life. I'm going to give it to you to the fullest. I'm going to give it to you abundantly. I know that there's people who are paralyzed from the neck down, people with terminal illness, and they're more happier than they ever have been in their life because that illness, that injury, that monkey wrench in their plans forced them to draw closer to the Lord. And they begun to realize the truth of the resurrection power, the truth of the life that's in Christ to the point where their bodies don't even matter anymore. If you're in that situation, hang in there. You've been blindsided. You're bewildered. Hang in there. Because it's not over yet. The fat lady hasn't sung. The curtains have not been drawn. Just as the disciples didn't see the crucifixion coming, they didn't see the resurrection coming. And you don't see the victory that's coming your way as well. 
And it may not be the way you thought it was going to be. You think of Naaman who got leprosy. He assumed, he thought, he would just go to the prophet, wave his hands over his leprosy, and he'd be healed. The guy's telling me to bathe in this dirty river. Come on! And his servant said, well, if he would have told you to do something crazy, wouldn't you have done it? I mean, he's just telling you to bathe in a river. What could have hurt? He didn't see his healing coming. It didn't come as the way he expected it. But, but it came. And your, your resurrection, in whatever situation your life is, is in and is at, it's coming. Just wait for it. I'm sure those three days seemed like an eternity to those disciples that were sitting in the upper room, locked away. And the three days is going to seem like an eternity for you. But if you trust him and press into him, he will give you the resurrection. He will give you the victory. may not in the way you think it will be, but it will be better than you expected. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are the resurrection and the life. Physically, mentally, and spiritually. You died and took our place so that we might live. You rose to seal that. And we praise you and we thank you for it. We give you praise, we give you honor, we give you glory, even in the midst of our trials, even in the midst of our tribulation, even in the midst of our sorrow and pain and sickness. We choose to praise you because we choose to believe that there's going to be a resurrection coming in our life. Just as you rose from the dead and conquered death, hell, and the grave, you can conquer anything and everything in our life. So, Lord, as Isaiah said, those that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not grow weary. They shall run and not faint. Thank you, Lord, that you're going to resurrect our lives. Not so we could be happy, but so we could bring glory to you. So we could bring others to you. We love you and we praise you. And we ask these things and give thanks in Yeshua's name. Amen.